Rivka, I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm super happy to be here with you. Christina and I used to share space in Butler Library like 47 years ago. It was like a 17 lifetimes ago. Yeah. I don't even remember what happened last week. <laughs> um, I just want to start by saying uh, thank you to Center for Fiction and thank you to Rivka and FSG for um, having me be your interlocutor tonight. I'm so excited to be here. I have admired your writing, Rivka, for such a long time. Um, I admire your sensibility, your intelligence, your wit. Um, for me, I think it comes down to how you're both off kilter and very humane, very deeply humane. So whenever I read your work, I feel like put in touch with human weakness and foibles. And as we see in this new novel, pettiness and cruelty, but also you're in touch with what is noble and good about people as well. And I don't mean that in a sappy or sentimental way, but like a really kind of tough, tough, compassionate way. Um, but so with all of that, I, I think that we should start by you kind of briefly situating us in the novel um, for people who haven't had the pleasure of reading it yet. Great. Well, first of all, thank you uh, to the Center for Fiction, like Christine said, for hosting us. And thank you, Christine. I'm so, uh, I'm basically so sad we're not in a room together, but I'll like get over that part. Um, but I mean, not to sound like a cheesy mirror, but um, I've like admired Christine for a really long time. Um, and also when she finally decided to write a novel, The Life of the Mind, um, which is a very, very, very funny novel, I sort of felt like a secret cousinship with you because the life of the mind was one of those phrases. It was like a mystery in my childhood because my dad was always like referring to the life of the mind and like whether it was available or not available or who had it or who didn't have it. I just had no, I just had no idea what he was talking about. And I was um, anyways, but I feel like there's something like special about that idea that it's both like absurd and a joke and somehow mm -hmm. central and so important. So um, with all, all of that preamble, I guess the novel is um, remarkably easy to describe. It's basically uh, based on real events. Um, a woman named Katerina Kepler and she uh, it sort of at the end of her life, and she was already pretty much the oldest person in town. Um, it's 17th century Germany, and she, at the end of her life, she comes under suspicion for being a witch and ends up being in this long, protracted, uh, pretty terrifying trial that, that um, you know, threatens her life and also the sort of livelihood and status of her whole family. And one of the reasons we know a lot about this particular witch trial is because she also was the mother of the astronomer and at the time the imperial mathematician, Johannes Kepler. Um, and that's the basic setting, but um, one thing that's sort of important to remember and that I didn't really know until I was looking into Kepler more is that part of what's moving about him as a scientist and a thinker is that he was, so he was a nobody from nowhere, from a, from a nobody family, from a single mom, kind of paying for everything on her own and the sort of husband's kind of disappeared. So that's kind of the kind of woman she is and the kind of background he comes from. So the novel follows her perspective. She's illiterate, but obviously very intelligent. Um, and then also the perspective of other people in the town. And I guess we should say it's this book right here. Everyone knows your mother is a witch. Um, so I guess what your description is just immediately made me think about is how this novel is in some ways connected to your very different first novel, Atmospheric Disturbances, which is also about a person whose, whose identity is somehow in question or disrupted in some way. Um, although, of course, this book is a piece of historical fiction. And so I, I guess I want to start by talking about the research of it and like how did you come up with this idea? Were you researching Johannes Kepler? Were you researching Katerina? Yeah, you know, I was working on, as is like the way things go, I was working on a different novel altogether. I'm always working on like something I throw away. So like I was just like really grateful not to, to finish it before I threw it away. So I was working on something else, but um, like a lot of people, like the past five years have been really stressful and that's altered what has been meaningful to me as reading. And I found that like my quote unquote comfort reading for some 
reason that I didn't really understand what it was, was like reading the biographies of scientists. Um, and I just like, it really held my attention. And, and now with like a bit of time, I think, oh, I get it. Like these were people who were, um, you know, pushed around by history and politics often in quite uh, dramatic ways, especially because they had a special relationship to the pursuit of truth, which is often very threatening um, to power structures. So I think that was part of what was going on. Anyways, I wanted to learn more about, I read about kind of whatever would come my way. Um, and I really wanted to learn more about Johannes Kepler because he's Johannes Kepler and um, because I have a friend who named their child Kepler. It was sort of that silly. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, but there's not like a great book in English about Kepler. Like there's a one sort of seminal 20th century biography in German. It's enormous. It's translated awkwardly. It feels dated. It's wonderful and interesting, but there wasn't like something like what I had been reading about other scientists. So kind of on a, just cause there was nothing else to do. I sort of like was like, well, there's this book and it's not really about Kepler. It's about his mom. Okay, I'll like order it. Mm -hmm. And then I read it. I'd never really knew anything. Like interestingly in the seminal biography of Kepler in the first edition, he chose to leave out the witch trial of Kepler's mother because it was still such a stain on the family. Wow. Like he said, I didn't wow. want to distract from the story of Kepler by wow. reading this. Um, and then like in later editions, he adds like a few paragraphs. Um, so anyways, I, there was this book called The Astronomer and the Witch by the scholar Ulinka Rublak. It came out from Oxford Press in 2018 and it is incredibly well-written and mesmerizing and the story was electric for me like um and one thing I noticed when I was reading the book which is uh it's like a scholarly work for certain but she's also written it in a way to make it very accessible to us normals um and uh I noticed that when I was reading it I was reading it with like a sense of suspense like oh, I wonder if like she really is going to turn out to be a witch at the end <laughs> I mean also of course a sense of suspense will she live or will she be executed but when I noticed that emotion in myself that was so strange, that was also part of what kind of catalyzed the interest. And then that was like suddenly took over. It was sort of like spelling bee at the New York Times. It was all I wanted to do. I just didn't want to do anything else. And I like couldn't pay attention to other things. So yeah. that was basically how the research started. It started with that book and then it went to the index of that book and then it kind of followed out from there. And did you always know that this was going to be a novel or was there ever a moment where you were going to write in a different genre? I think I, I think I knew it was going to be a novel. I mean, it was so captivating that she was illiterate and doesn't basically never gets to represent her. You know, we just don't, we basically don't hear her voice. There's like a couple little sentences we have from the record, but you know, there's no letters and there's no, so that was captivating and also, um, there was something kind of a little slight Oscar Wilde element about her situation where it's arguable, but it seems like maybe if she hadn't said they're lying about me, she might never have gotten into mm -hmm. that position. So that element was interesting. And I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm still trying to figure out why she held my attention so much because Unfortunately, there's like millions of stories of people who had terrible persecutions and horrible things happen to them, but she just really held my attention and it was sort of like the only voice that I was interested in for a while. Yeah, so her, I mean, speaking of voice, her voice is in incredible. Like I, I don't feel, I feel like I've never met a character like her before. Um, I just wanna quote a little bit. Um, so she's at one point in the novel, she's at the home of a person that she calls the false unicorn, who's like the Duke, right? Who's in yeah. charge of, of everything. And, um, and she's trying, she's bringing him a present of this silver goblet. And she kind of realizes after she's given it to him that it's a trap that she's created for herself, right? So now it looks like she's trying to bribe him and now it's, it's even worse for her um, than it was before. But um, uh, she's 
thinking about this goblet and she's, I think she's just handed it to him and it has this dragon on the stem. And she describes the dragon as having a relaxed expression. <laughs> and then she says, if I were a dragon, I might also feel relaxed. If I had talons, the ability to breathe fire, if I no longer existed, those would be relaxing qualities. And I just like, I love this and it's so weird and it's so Katarina. And I wanna know if you can tell us a little bit about like how you found her voice. Was there one moment? Was there one fact or how did it come to you? Yeah, I, I um... Yeah, I feel like sappy about this, but I feel like um, one, it, it weirdly was not that hard to find her voice. Like it just, it, so it wasn't that hard to find her voice, um, which I think was like a sign that this was like a novel I would finish as opposed to one of the many novels I, I wouldn't finish. Um, and then I wonder like, well, why was I so confident? Like I'm not, there's, I mean, that's absurd. That's like absurd that I was like, this is a voice, I'm gonna work with it. but. Um, but I think I sort of know that historical novels are, are, are part of the fantasy genre. Like it's like, it isn't fantasy, but it, I just think that's also a useful genre label for it. And so there's like, I feel like a natural triangle, which is sort of the truth and the person who's dreaming about having full access to that moment in the past, which they're not going to have. And then everything they fill in, which isn't like recoverable, like directly recoverable in some way, um, of course is gonna be, um, you know, filled in emotionally from their own, their own life. And I just, for me, I just, um, it's not very hard for me to think of an older women, woman, a number of older women who are like, on the one hand, extremely, capable, have a, have a special kind of charisma and confidence, and at the same time, can't, like, don't read the room. Like, it's not just that they don't want to adhere to the social norms, and maybe there's an element of like, oh, I'm, I'm rebelling against social norms, but I almost think with Katerina, I'm more thinking of her, and in line with these other voices of, you know, it just wouldn't even be an option to adhere to the social norms that's like, that would involve a level of kind of, um, I guess what we would now call like literacy of cultural capital, you know, being able to read that um, and, and adjust oneself um, to present oneself in different ways. And, and so that, that's often like a really funny magnetic person because the things they say have that quality that we call sincerity, I guess, just it feels unguarded or, unpolished even if they themselves think it is polished and guarded like it just comes at a funny angle so so that was what was key for me with her with her yeah, voice that makes sense and like it kind of she she can move the plot then too because she's always doing stuff that's kind of digging her deeper into trouble but she's doing out of a, at it out of a very genuine place um, yeah and in that sense I connect her to these kind of scientific mathematical personalities. Um, like I really did think, you know, I thought she is the mother of Johannes Kepler. And I sort of took, I sort of decided out, you know, with some basis in, in the, in fact, in some fantasy that he got a lot of that kind of way of seeing, that fresh way of seeing from her. Because I think of those people, I mean, it's a bit of a stereotype and it has some truth who sort of think that just because something is true or they've sort of shown you the evidence, that's like, that's gonna compel you. <laughs> and of course that doesn't compel most people. So um, I thought of her as like one of those types who thought, but I've just explained to you why you should believe this or understand this. And the fact that this thing in the world is true should, should manifest in some way. So that was also um, important to me in the way that she moves through the the world and the kinds of arguably difficulty she provides herself with. Yeah, one of the things, I'm gonna jump around a little bit, but one of the things that I really love about her character is also, um, so she's a mother of adult children and the book has so many wonderful moments about motherhood. And even though Katerina's children are grown up, the book also has these like really moving moments about babies and little children. 
uh, Katerina has like a very special connection with her, um, it's her granddaughter. Is that Marushal? Is that how you say yeah. her name? Um, and I'm, I'm also thinking that, and, I'm, and we'll talk more about the way the book grades in testimonies from other people who aren't Katerina, but there's also this very moving testimony from a tailor's wife who's talking about the two children that died of hers. And she talks about how she is a very fortunate woman to have known her children. It's just such an interesting way to think about the parent-child relationship as being an opportunity to meet someone in the world. And I would just wonder if you could say anything about what you were thinking about, about motherhood or babies or kids as you were writing her character. Yeah, I mean, it, um, it ended up being very important to me and it wasn't sort of like obvious to me when I was um, first learning about her story, how important to me emotionally that was as like, uh, a bridge to that time. But of course, like one of the most overwhelming facts about sort of living in 1618 to me as a modern person, and I think to a lot of people is that it was just absolutely um, an ordinary event, ordinary, horrible event that happened all the time that babies died and young children died. And it was just, um, it was something that even children had to experience all the time. They you know, most of them lost siblings and most of them watched babies die. And, and, and um, I remember, um, even though it's like a hundred years earlier, like I, I read a fair amount of Martin, about Martin Luther when I was researching this book and he kind of had this deranged idea that because it happened all the time, maybe people were kind of okay with babies dying. <laughs> um, and I think before I had a, a baby, I thought, well, it's just not, I had this, I now understand like deranged idea that when a baby dies, that's not that sad because you don't really know them or you, you haven't like, and, uh, and as soon as I like really had an, an experience of being near a baby, my imagination was enlarged and I was able to see that. But to go back, I was wondering, there was this moment where Martin Luther um, loses his first child at a pretty young age. I don't remember exactly when, but maybe eight months. And he writes like a letter to a friend about just how, how shocked he is by how devastated he is. Um, and anyways, that was like important for me because it, I thought, no, it wasn't easy. It was just terrible suffering, even if it happened to many people and it happened often. So actually from the very beginning, I thought, well, you know, even as a young girl, this is like a young girl who's like accustomed herself to watching this happen. And, and actually in the real life story, the Kepler family lost more children than I, than I put in the novel because I thought it would be too overwhelming to put it all in but it seemed to me like that moment where as horrible as her situation is being persecuted as a witch there's actually like a kind of blacker hole um that's that's right next to it and so that and all of those emotions seems important to me um it's i mean i think it's so effective and so moving from a reader's point of view because it also gives the book has does have this sort of black hole of suffering at the heart of it and it does make Katerina so tough and all of the women in the book are so sort of tough and toughened by it um so I, I mean I found it was one of my favorite aspects of the book actually and it was a place where kind of like history and the contemporary really seemed to meet um in that place they really met for me in the ideas about the like rational and irrational they really met. And then again, in the voices, which are so modern feeling. I mean, sometimes I felt almost like I want now you to talk about the multivocal testimonies, but there's this one character who's a grave digger and he just feels like he stepped out of Shakespeare, but like Shakespeare has been translated by like a very hip contemporary writer, you know? And, and it's just, it, it gives the books so this just interesting like person of all of these familiar yet totally unfamiliar voices. So do you want to talk about the testimonies and maybe read one? Yeah, um, you know, like maybe you secretly are my cousin because that's, that's actually my favorite testimony. Um, and it was, uh, 
So it is like really in the historical record but that they access not the actual grave, you know, it ends up being sort of, I, anyways, I made it a little closer than it is in history, but there really was this moment where she gets in trouble and it kind of comes up in the, as like one of the things against her that she did ask um, a man who she saw sort of working in the graveyard, oh, like, you know, how, how difficult would it be to dig up my father's skull because it might be interesting to cover it in silver. <laughs> and, uh, this, and that actually was a somewhat reasonable request, but, uh, but it obviously sounds quite unreasonable. Um, and there actually is a record of, of a lot of the testimonies in the trial. And I took great liberties with that because I wanted to have a chance to use those spaces, not to just shed light on what was said at trial, but also like the people around her and, and what they were going through. So I'll read that testimony a little bit um, because obviously someone who works as a grave digger is one of the lower, um, is lower in the, in the social status. So they have a sort of different way of um, relating to the court. The one thing I took absolutely from the historical record is the opening question of every deposition. So the opening question although obviously it's in English um, and uh, a wonderful young German scholar called Alexander Beatty helped me with that translation. Um, it's direct from the record. So here we go. Um, Do you understand that any false testimony you knowingly give will provoke God's great anger in your earthly life and would deliver your soul onto Satan upon the death? That sounds right. What is your name, age and profession? Martin Volmer, I work as a grave digger in Rutschheim. Can you tell us about the unusual request that was made of you? The people I meet aren't out to buy a loaf of bread. They're often in a peculiar mood. Though not always, but I do receive many unusual requests. Uh, we want to speak to you about Katerina Kepler. Okay. 18 years ago, Frau Kepler asked you to dig up her father's skull. No, not exactly. 17 years. No, I mean, not exactly asking to dig up. You are under oath, Herr Volmer. It is my habit to tell the truth at all times. Okay, tell us what happened. Frau Kepler was visiting a different grave, not her father's grave. She was visiting the recently dug grave of one of her grandchildren. The wreath on her father's grave was dry and old. She brought over some blessed thistle, some holly, and made it into a fresh wreath for her father's grave. Not the most regular of wreaths, but it was nice. Then what? I had not dug the grave for Frau Kepler's grandchild, but I was digging another grave nearby for a shoemaker. Look, I see so many things. You never think of a grave digger as a great witness of life. People treat me as if I'm not there, but then this woman, Frau Kepler, she was calling me. Turns out I was working not far from the grave of Melchior Golden then, that was her dad. I'd known the man a bit. And Frau Kepler, she made an unusual inquiry. She said she'd heard it was a fine thing to have a skull covered in silver, that you could drink from that. She asked me, could I dig up her dad's skull? She wanted, it, she wanted to send it to her son, the astrologer in Prague. Do you often receive such demonic requests? I was... I was once asked to dig up the liver of a dead infant. I didn't do it, but the person didn't mean any harm. Another time I was asked to bury a beautiful shepherd dog, not just anywhere, but in the main graveyard. Do you wanna know who asked that? I'm under oath, I'll tell you. The Duchess made the request. Dogs aren't allowed a Christian burial. Now that seems obvious to me, even uneducated as I am, but of course, grave digging is my expertise. I learned not to judge, but to explain, very simple. Also common is people come digging to retrieve brooches or rings. Maybe they're common thieves, but it might be someone who comes from love, someone who regrets their decision of what to bury with the dead. It's often the grave digger who's blamed when these things go missing. I ask you, would a man risk his good name and employ for a crime that is so easily solved? Let's return to Frau Kepler. Well, there are different opinions on whether a man may choose to come back for his wife's ring or a mother for her child's toy. I'd like to give a sermon one day on what I've observed of the nature of humans. I tell you, it would be very engaging to the public, much more engaging than the pap they usually serve on a Sunday. To confirm, the accused asked you to dig up her father's skull. 
no, but close. She asked me both if it would be possible and how much it would cost to dig up. And how did you answer? I said I'd need to ask my boss, who at the time was Pastor Graf. He's the fellow who's making the majority of decisions about the graves, about their location, all the questions and the rare circumstances of someone being moved and so on. She persisted. Uh, she saw it would be a whole back and forth and round the band. She said to never mind about it. She feared your boss, Pastor Graf. That wasn't my impression, no. A skull is a legally recognized tool of sorcery. We all have skulls, sir. This was many years ago. I'm willing to talk as long as it's useful to you, but all of you. But I find this very strange to have so many people interested in this conversation. Of all the different conversations I've had in my years of digging graves, this was not one of the remarkable ones. Thank you for your time, Air Volmer. It's a funny thing being called up like this. I've enjoyed myself, all told. How did you find me again? So why include the testimonies? And I mean, there's, there's a way in which they're kind of be like these little short stories for me. And I wonder if that was something that you were thinking too, or? Like, um, I think I, on like a practical level, like I felt like it did like the labor of what is this time and place and who are these people and what do they do and what are their concerns? Um, and then like on a compositional level, like I'm someone who's like, I usually, I'm not, I like never really think like, what does this book mean or what are its themes or what is it about? But I'll just think, okay, the energy is like, needs to alter. Like something has to, something has to change in the tone or something has to change in the velocity or something has to change in um, like where in the distance. So I almost think of like moving forward in that way. And so those two things sort of met and I just found, I love, I mean, he's actually a pretty straight, he's a pretty like honest guy or whatever, <laughs> but I love the sound of the way that people um, lie to themselves. That's like one of my favorite, that's my obsession. And so, um, and not just the, you know, the sound of someone lying deliberately to other people, like that's also interesting, but not as interesting to me. And then, the, but the testimonies were a chance to get to hear all these different egos kind of reconciling to themselves their position, their position of minor power and how they were using it, you know, because some, you know, people related to it differently, but, you know, obviously there was this kind of dangerous thing. All of a sudden there was this woman who any association with her could, could, could put you at risk. And just like watching the sound of people navigate that and the little, you know, the little lies they have to tell to themselves along the way about sort of why they come to the conclusions they do and why they have the convictions they do. It's just, that's like my, that's why I will always read every Ishiguro novel that ever comes out because that's what they're all about. It's like lying to yourself. Yeah. And um, like, how much do you think this book should be seen as like a, as a book of the Trump, of the Trump years, right? As a book that's about the sort of vexed misogyny or, or whatever that we all had to live through coming from the White House, the sort of bullying, and all of that. I mean, do you see this book as in its way about that period of our collective history or no? Yeah, I sort of feel like when I am working, I'm, I'm, uh, why well, I, I feel like everyone had their relationship to that time period. Um, I, like many people, I started to hate my laptop and it just like came to me with, um, a kind of darker version of what humans were like than I sort of had like carried along with me up to that time. Um, so for me, I sort of felt like I was like escaping thinking about the various questions that brought up and I also had like uh, a block like I my only way of like understanding what was happening was like all these people are insane like a few of these people are evil and the rest are insane and that's like not actually like a very nuanced or informative like filter for what we've all witnessed uh, over the past four years so I was sort of fleeing and I sort of felt like I was you know I 
failing to understand what was going on and therefore like, and also like miserable. It's like miserable to comp contemplate. So I just like ran away from it. And I think that's why the research was so gratifying. And I loved researching this book. And I loved knowing that the 30 years war began, but also at some point it ended. I loved knowing that the trial began, but then it ended. And um, so I definitely was not like thinking about our current political moment, but at the same time, like when you're running away from something, it's totally guiding your path. Like you don't run away from something to anywhere. You run to somewhere that's like obviously very decided by what you're running away from. So in that sense, I think, well, like, of course, like, of course, this is a very contemporary novel because that's what I was desperately like exiting was the contemporary moment. Um, I want to tell people that they should drop questions for Ripka in the chat. Um, in like 10 minutes, we'll be able to open it up. So I'm sorry, drop it in the Q&A. Um, if you put it in the chat, I'll probably find it there too. Um, I just had something that I wanted to ask based on what you were just saying and it escaped me. So I'm gonna ask a different question, which is, are there works of historical fiction that you read that guided you in any way? Or do you love that as a genre or like actually you don't and this is just your own thing or what's your relationship like to historical fiction? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it was like the genre I was most well read in. Um, so like, of course there were like, there are like works of historical fiction that are really interesting to me. Um, and especially like those hybrid works, like The Return of Martin Gare, which is sort of part history and part imagined. Um, and The Cheese and the Worms is also like a great book by a historian, which kind of like is in between. Um, and both of those books, I guess I love because when the historical record comes forward, it feels so recognizable. It doesn't have that sort of strangeness that you're always being promised that it's sort of like an unknowable other time. In fact, like you hear these kind of cadences and kind of human folly kind of that feels quite familiar. So there was that, but um, I did enjoy reading as a sort of part of the research, like anything I could find that people at that time period would have read um and it was like so that was like a pleasure of working on the book and also um this one book that I really admire so much it's like the create it's like a crazy if it's possible to have a book even darker than Don Quixote or Don Quixote as my dad the life of the mind man would say um and it's called the, Inve the Adventures of Simplicius Simplicissimus, <laughs> which was sort of like this gem that sort of like leapt out um, from, you know, that time period that was that you can read it in a, an amazing translation just in the Penguin Classic series, um, which is from a tiny bit later. It's more like the Thirty Years' War, the later part of it and comes out shortly thereafter. But uh, that was also like a book that definitely influenced um, putting this book together and the sound of it and the, and sort of the sense of the community. And yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the cows in the book? There are two cows who are really important. Yeah, the cows are important. One, like it's so calming to be near a cow. Um, and also it was like a part of their daily life. And there was like a detail in the historical record that I found moving because there are very few details about Katarina Kepler, but she was known to, um, like as a child, she was she was the one who would go and gather branches because they would sort of fill the barn with branches to keep uh, the animals warm. And it was just it was just a little detail, which I don't think I made up. It's like possible I transposed it from someone else, but I'm pretty sure in my mind that's like kind of one of the few things we know about her. And so that was just like a tiny start, but then also um, to go back to babies, like I feel like the way we relate to a non-speaking creature has, um, you know, has like other intimacies become possible um, mm -hmm. that, that are sort of like effaced or vanished once, once people are so in dialogue. So I kind of, 
felt that it seemed natural to conflate animals which have a special, you know, which feel numinous to a lot of people, not just to her, um, to me as well. And, and kind of the spirits of, of children, especially children who were gone. So I felt like those things were together and sort of reinforced her connection with with her cow basically because it was it was this kind of non-speaking numinous spirit that provided a lot that needed a lot from her that offered a lot so um well there's also i mean katarina has this close relationship with nature and i mean what i guess we would call like holistic healing you know yeah. like she knows about herbs she knows about yeah. And yet um, it seems both that that knowledge is totally widespread at, in this period and yet is starting to come under our kind of suspicion. And, and like there's something sort of wrong or potentially witchy about the way that she's employing what seems like is actually quite common um, knowledge of the natural world. Yeah, and that was also really interesting to learn about and even to connect to the current moment because um, there's actually kind of across geography and across time until you get to the really present moment. There's this tradition um, where it's really the women who are the physicians. They just don't have like a license and there's not sort of a guild that means that the what they have to offer is has sort of been certified by, by a group. And so they were both um, extremely, had a lot to offer and also were naturally threatening to professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so though I feel like those things go together, like even just um, recently with all of this vaccine stuff, like it, it's sort of interesting that, um, you know, before the smallpox vaccine was invented, like all the women who worked with cows, all the dairy maids, they just would sort of like scrape the pustules of the cowpox and and infect themselves. And that was just something that they did. And it was either like terrifying and weird and primitive. That's how it was perceived. But also like, they were like, oh, but they keep not dying of smallpox. <laughs> well, like they have this curious ability to not die of smallpox. So you can kind of like access how that would seem depending on how you felt about a bunch of milkmaids having like important knowledge, how that could seem seductive and interesting and worthwhile and valid or threatening and supernatural and and creepy and kind of non-christian um so um so it's just like interesting and she's she's part of that like she did like what we would just call research um especially on like a treatment for a particular skin disease that was in her family and she, she literally it's what we would call research. She kind of varied, changed different variables, altered different things, <laughs> tried it in different ways. Um, and, and she, I think, was valued for that until she wasn't valued for that. So it was one of those powers, like almost all powers that can be, you can be like, oh, I'm glad this person has this power or I'm frightened that this person has this power. So I think it's sort of, that helped me kind of connect to how she functioned in other people's imagination. That's so interesting. I'm gonna take a question from the Q&A. This is, um, the question is, can you talk about the role Simon plays as interlocutor and mediator of our encounters with Katerina? Yeah, Simon, um, so Simon is her neighbor uh, and he is literate and he writes and he basically takes down, since she can't write, she turns to him and he writes down her, sort of what she wants to, say kind of to the world um but the way that simon came to me was there was like one small detail in the rue black book um like a factual detail where sort of halfway through the trial um the person who was functioning as her legal guardian who had been her neighbor that's like a real life detail asks the court to excuse him from his duties sort of says and asks basically says i'm i'm, I'm really old and I'm not like the right person to do this. And that just like that detail was like kind of radioactive for me. And I just thought how 
dramatic that must have been for the people at the time and what that must have been like for him and who was he like who was this person who was like willing to associate himself with someone who was under suspicion um and then why does he pull back from that and and what was that relationship at all um so that was kind of where he emerged from but also I felt like I connect to Simon because Simon is the person um you know, I've never been persecuted as a witch and a lot of the horrible things that have happened, especially like in recent times have like not happened to me. And that sense of, and you know, we sort of say, oh, well, you know, if we're a witness or whatever, but like that feels so hollow. And of course it's like completely, not completely, but it, you know, it's grossly insufficient. Um, and so on some level, I thought, the bystander, the well, the basically well-meaning bystander and how little they can do and what they're capable of and not capable of and what courage they have or don't have. That just seemed, that I guess that really mattered to me. That perspective really mattered to me. And that's why he sort of, he starts out as a sort of silent amanuensis or relatively silent amanuensis. And he sort of emerges later because of course he, he gets to emerge later. He sort of has like um, less pressure on him. Yeah, what a great answer. Um, I'm gonna take another question, um, which is, okay, this is a question connecting back to your comment about Ishiguro. Um, so Barry says, I think Ishiguro always uses the first person narrator as part of his exploration of self-deception. How do you decide what perspective to use when telling a story? Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes I wonder why anything is not in first person because you get this automatic gain because there's this built in dramatic irony where even if they're a quote unquote reliable narrator, of course, like no one's a reliable narrator. So you immediately get that sort of like ironic thrill. Um, old fashioned meaning of irony, like the sort of gap in knowledge, like, okay, like the narrator is telling me this, but I can kind of see around their shoulder and I notice this and that and that. And so that's just like fun. It's fun the way, it, you know, it, it, it's just like a, it's just literally fun. It's like a form of energy. So I, I pretty much say to myself, like, I don't know why anything isn't first person, um, but I do, I can easily think of books I love to read that are in third person and I've done a little bit of third person but when I think about them they're never just third person like a Muriel Spark narrator is kind of a god's eye view but what a weird god and like it's such like a specific um voice so I can't really say like I know how I decide what to use but I know that I always want to take advantage of that um that space that I think really no one does better than Ishiguro. I mean, he does that, uh, feel like he's sort of the master, the master of it. Yeah, and then your novel does by kind of giving us multiple first persons, we yeah. kind of get the sort of jostling fun of a more omniscient view, but we still have all of these different voices. Yeah, um, I like okay. that, yeah. There are more questions here let me see here is a question um what do you think best prepared you for being a writer that's interesting i remember there used to be this like little new yorker cartoon that said dear mom and dad thanks for the happy childhood now i'll never be a writer <laughs> which i thought was like so great um and i actually like had like a happy childhood so I don't know why uh, I'm a writer, but I do feel like the most formational experience, I guess, like I feel like I, or like part of my identity that feels like closest to me is just being uh, the child of immigrants. And I sort of have noticed in my life again and again, I'll find like, I really connect to somebody and then their parents are immigrants or whatever so there's like something there and I do feel like that is like there's many different ways to arrive at it but I feel like it's pretty 
you know, it's a, it's a truism, but one that I think is true where I think becoming like a writer or any sort of life of the mind person <laughs> um, has to do with like nothing seeming correct or stable. Not that like every, not that everything is wrong, but that nothing is right. So I sort of feel like that's a natural immigrant experience where you think, okay, like my household is this way and these other households are not like my household and my both of them seem to have to be valid in some ways and absurd in other ways um so I sort of feel like that was like my path to having that instability that I sort of associate with um any sort of creative profession but I think there's many forms of instability like an unhappy childhood or whatever it might be so um, that just happens to be my form of instability um Okay, we have just like five more minutes. So I'm gonna, here's another question from the Q&A um, from Matthew. The question is, it sounds like you Hi, did Matthew. a considerable amount of research for the book. Can you discuss how the research process and writing process unfolded their relationship with one another? Did you finish the research and then start writing? Did you do them both simultaneously? Did the facts feel constraining or did, were you free to make things up? I know you've touched on this a little bit, but I am interested in knowing how much you were going back to the history once you were in your own novel. Yeah, I sort of um, actually like reading more than I like writing. I don't know if that's, I, sometimes I'm like feel really like I must be like, I'm just such a poser. I'm really just a reader. Like, and maybe, I, uh, but, but at other times I'm like, oh, right. I'm the opposite insecurity. I like, I, don't think I like research enough. And uh, it's like, oh, this is why I'm not a good writer because I don't like to do research, so. Well, I don't know if I actually like am good at research or, or but um, but I like that you get to read when you're, do when you're doing it. And like, so I feel like, um, so, so I actually feel like that was always the way like back into the writing and not like rigorous research, like, oh, I must go find out fact X or fact Y. Um, although I had like some, um, Sometimes there were, there were things like that, but it was more like I must go find, and I had some wonderful help with this. Um, I must go find things that are sort of proximate to the things that interest me and see what like pops out of them. Because there were, you know, there was like a, you know, there was a, an, another, another book by the same scholar called like the, basically the crimes of women in early modern Germany. But it had details like, you know, the salt seller's wife and how she, you know, gets in trouble because she's selling it sort of offhand to the Jews. And everyone knows that the Jews then sell it sort of off to outside of the like guidance of how you're supposed to price it. And I was, you know, just like amazing little details that like quickly, like it's like they expand in water and they give you so much about the world. Um, and I just, I just love the research for that. Not so much to be like, oh, is this thing I imagine correct? Because, but more like, can I like gather as many kind of magnetic details as possible? Because they sort of, fit, they make this world very real to me. That is, that actually that totally clarifies what my reading experience was, which was that I never felt bogged down in exposition, but I was totally in, the world that you were creating and I think that's exactly it there were these little magnetic details that that did expand so I think you were very successful well that's very nice of you I'm very happy to hear that um there's a question that was in the chat someone wanted I always want people to know book titles someone wanted to you to repeat the title um of the book you mentioned after Don Quixote the adventures of oh. Simplicitous the adventures of Simplicius um, Simplicissimus. So I don't know how you pronounce that name. It's obviously a goofy made up name, but that's the, that's the name of the book. And uh, there's an, a translation into English that is um, fantastic uh, in the Penguin Classic series. Yes. Oh, someone typed it up very, someone, right. someone even spelled it correctly, which is fantastic. Okay. Well, um, it's five to seven, which I think is when Melanie told us that we should wrap up so I guess that we should wrap up and I just thank you Rivka it's like so fun to talk to you I thank you Christine
<laughs> I hope it's like ice cream. I'd like to share an ice cream cone with you or really anyone who's here <laughs> anytime soon. <laughs> that's just like um, a swirly one, you know. So that's what I'd like to do. So thank you guys. Thank ice you. cream and literature. Okay. <laughs> Get your book and meet us at the Center for Fiction for Ice Cream. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Uh, it was great to hear you both. Congratulations again, Ripka, on the book. And we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.